Well, thanks to all of you. It is, it is really a joy to be here this morning with you. I, this is the first time that I have done this presentation, and so it has been uh, exciting for me to put this together. I hope a few pieces of information that will come out will be helpful. I think maybe the best thing I'm going to show you uh, here at the end are a list of sources on the internet that I consider to be the truth tellers, the real truth tellers that, that, that we can, can trust. Uh, in, in thinking about making this presentation uh, to the Oatmeal Club, I could not uh, start without thinking about Lou Mandel. I mean, Lou Mandel has always been, or was always the go-to guy when it came to uh, matters of, uh, of investing and economics, and I had a really great chuckle some months ago when I called up the program chair for a particular organization. And I said, look, we got financial literacy month coming up. Our foundation and BCF, Bainbridge Community Foundation, co-sponsor that. I would love to make a presentation to your organization as a part of that, of that month. And, uh, and the response was, well, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd like to have you. but." Lou Mandel talked to us twice, and we really know all we need to know about investing. So I thought, God bless Lou Mandel. <laughs> he was absolutely wonderful. I never met anybody who knew more things about more topics than our friend Lou. I am not a CFP or a CPA or a, uh, an estate planner. Uh, I am somebody who just happens to love the history and, and the realities of that investment process I want to talk about. Uh, going back until I was, I was 19 years old was when I started applying for a job uh, in the brokerage industry, only to find out uh, being a broker wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. But I've always enjoyed this, the process of studying and teaching. Uh, and yet, I think it's important to understand I get no joy from the process of investing. I do not have one penny that is invested for fun. Uh, my work is, uh, is about teaching others. And that's what our mission uh, of, our, of our foundation is. It basically is to give people who want to be do-it-yourself investors all the tools they need to take care of the most important client in the world themselves. So, uh, we have over 160 tables that provide numbers that we think are valuable for people who are trying to be a better investor. And as far as our work, just so you'll understand how narrow we are, it's all about investing, investing in the best equity asset classes, knowing how to combine them. And I'll show you today some of the things that are now very common in the way of combining equity asset classes, then how much fixed income do you wanna have in your portfolio to address the risk of a portfolio? And then we have probably 70 tables that have to do with distributions, taking different amounts, taking them in different ways. And finally, what we think most people who, are, who wanna be do-it-yourself investors want is they want somebody to pick the investments because there are 20,000 different things they can pick from. And so we narrow that down to what we consider to be the very best equity ETFs. In every asset class, we have a best in class ETF through our eyes, not through many other people's eyes, because as you know, in this industry, everybody's got their own idea of what the best is. Warren Buffett says what I think is almost most important in trying to help people is that you really only have to do a very few things right, as long as you don't do too many things wrong. And the reality is there are a lot of people who want us to do the wrong thing. As a matter of fact, and I don't, I, I'm not attacking Wall Street uh, when, when I say this, but the nature of Wall Street uh, and Wall Street includes publications and brokerage firms and insurance companies and, and lots of organizations today that don't have to be licensed. They can just be in there offering whatever their, 
most exciting thing is they have to offer, all of that is made to be complex because if it looks good and it's complex, certainly you can't do it. You need somebody to help. And that's, of course, where Wall Street raises their hand. But the fact is, out of all this complexity, they make billions and billions of dollars. And the reports that come out that say that Wall Street uh, costs people so many billion dollars a year, what they fail to add to that is that, and that money could have compounded in the pockets of the investors instead of, of Wall Street for the rest of their life. So we cannot overlook the terrible cost that we pay trying to be a, a member of the Wall Street clan. And what the studies show is that investors are making some two to 3% less than just being in the market. And here's an, here's an example. There's an organization called Dalmar. Now there's some, some argument about whether they compute these numbers the same way that Morningstar does. But the reality is their numbers show that over in this particular case, a 30 year period, while the S&P 500, the least productive of the major asset classes over the long run, and that's an, that's an important thing I think to understand, that, that the investors who invested in equity funds made over 3% less. And 3% less is a really big deal. And of course, that came partly because of all the expenses inside of the products that they invested in, but it also came because of their tendency to allow their emotions to overcome the intellect and, and, and to listen to the noise around us and do something oftentimes at the wrong time. So remember, this is the average equity fund investor. And I think about our kids and grandkids. If, if they could be average, that wouldn't be terrible. But the problem is, is that average numbers come from some numbers that are higher and some numbers that are lower. And I'd be worried about them being the lower numbers. So if we go back to get, a, to get an, a historical view of investing, I think it will give us an idea of how absolutely, how much more efficient, how much more profitable investing should be today. When we go back about 100 years, 1924, Edgar Lawrence Smith writes a book, and, and the title of the book is, is uh, I just, I've got a Common Stocks as Long-Term Investments. Common Stocks as Long-Term Investments. People did not at that point know that stocks were a better long-term investment than bonds. People looked at stocks as being purely speculative, many people as gambles. As a matter of fact, there were only about 10% of Americans were in the stock market uh, in, the, in the 20s. And by the way, the, the market was great for the first, uh, the, the first uh, year, right up to the peak in 1929, the, the, the market had compounded at about 14% a year. So the market, he comes out with his book that makes the case that from 1866 until now, at 1924, that the market has made a lot more money than bonds. People get excited about that. It's the first popular investment book of its kind. And then, of course, they walk right into 1929. But in between there, you have the first mutual fund. The, mutu the mutual funds were developed, in a sense, for rich people because rich people had their investment advisors, but their kids didn't have enough money to do it. And so these funds were formed for the children of rich people, which turned out to be one of the best investment securities that's ever been invented. But that 1929 peak was followed by the worst 40 year return since 1926. And that return for the S&P 500 was 8.9%. Not bad for the worst, which is something I try to get young people to understand because so many young people do not want to leave the safety of bonds. 
that while stocks obviously are not safe one day, a week, even a year at a time, but over an extended period of time, in a sense, there's nothing safer when we take inflation into consideration. But what happened from that is that people lost confidence in stocks. And so here was this uh, return. But by the way, it's also important to note that in 1929, from the peak, you start the 40 years of terrible returns. But the second best 40 years started in 1933. And so if, if you had the trust in the market, there were great possibilities. But even up until the 60s, Wall Street was in control. They were, they were selling load funds. The load funds were charging, in essence, 9.3% of that investment that you ended up with. So what's wrong with that? Because that is going to cost an investor over three quarters of 1% a year in returns because that money left their account and went into the hands of somebody else's account, the salesperson and the firm they worked for. That was, that was a time to make a lot of money. If you could convince people to, to, to buy mutual funds, a lot of people forget that when the money market funds originally came out, Wall Street tried to tack a, 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 a commission on that as well. And people just, are, just fought that. They said, our banks don't charge us a commission. What are you doing charging us a commission for something that's just like having money in the bank? And they backed off and, 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 and they all became in essence free. That's money market funds. Commissions were terribly high. It literally, if, if a commission was $50 on 100 shares of something, then if you bought 1,000 shares, it was 10 times 50 or $500. Today, you can actually make those trades for no commission at all. And, and, and so it, it is an amazing additional return to investors. Bid ask spread. You buy at the ask price, you sell at the bid price. That difference, oftentimes a quarter of 1%, uh, would go to what, what we would call the wholesale markup in the industry. And of course, that eventually gets changed. But that was very promise, very profitable and, and, and for the industry. Mutual funds were virtually all of them were actively managed. And of course, the idea was you tried to find the manager who had great recent returns because we as humans think literally, and when something's been doing well, I don't care if it's cryptocurrency or technology, there's a, a tendency to chase that performance. But in the 70s, things turned around. Things started going better for the individual investor. No load funds became popular. I mean, you were picking up over a half a percent a year just by being able to buy a no load fund. And they blessed the IRA, the individual retirement account in 1974. The thing I find so fascinating is that in 1962, there was a Keogh plan that allowed people who were in business for themselves, like doctors and lawyers and other people, to put away 10 times and more of what they would let the person put away into an IRA 12 years later. Never understood that. Why, why this big fat payday for this small group of people? And when they finally give the individual investor the ability to, to put money away, the limit was $1,500 to start with. It's just the way the, the program works. And they deregulated commissions. Schwab was the first one, to, the discount broker. They tried everything they could to make them look like uh, uh, an organization that must have ties to the, uh, uh, to the mafia, because look what they're doing. They're, they're offering these low, low fees. Well, those low, low fees just got lower over time. And then the biggest of all, a mutual fund comes to the public it is a complete flop. It doesn't work. They, they, they come out with the first index fund, John Bogle did in Vanguard, and they came out with an index fund that was to, to raise $150 million to get it started. They raised $11 million. And that wasn't uh, to the public directly. That was through the brokerage industry. Well, what do you think the brokerage industry thought 
about index funds. I mean, you can just you can feel the 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 the, the, the concern they would have that that would actually catch on. And 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 John Bogle, as we understand the story, fought to keep that fund open because the trustees considered shutting it down because nobody wanted it. So they did win. And slowly but surely, slowly, index funds caught hold. But it really wasn't until the late 90s that they became, reached a, let's call it a, a tipping point. But in 2001, another favorable outcome for investors, what was previously the, bid, the, the lowest bid and ask spread you could have was 1 16th of 1%. And then they were deregulated down to a spread of one one hundredth of one percent. So you could have a stock that could be theoretically uh, bid twenty dollars, ask twenty dollars and one cent. And that meant that not only were the commissions uh, coming down, but so was that spread between the bid and ask, was, which is a legitimate expense for investors to be concerned about. So today, what do we know? We know today that savvy investors who, who have taken the time to figure this out, and it shouldn't be that difficult to figure out, except again, there is so much noise of people who claim to have a better way, who claim that, that, that load funds have an advantage. You do get an advantage with a load fund. I've actually heard and seen in writing a broker telling a potential client that the advantage of the loaded funds is that with that commission, they can hire better managers, which is totally false. None of that money goes to the managers. The managers work out of what is in fact the, the, the expense ratio management fee. But today we know that passive does better than active. And that doesn't mean it will do better than all actives. As a matter of fact, when we look at 20 years worth of data, the SPIVA report, if you ever want to read an interesting report with a lot of numbers that shows you the inside of the returns of investments in mutual funds, that about one out of 10 actively managed funds is able to outperform the index itself. So there we are. We're looking at at 10 boxes in some sort of a, a contest here, we have to choose a box. They're all closed. We open one door from one box and we show you the return of the index itself. Now, there are all of these boxes there. One of them is likely to do better and the rest worse. And the problem is, is that whoever did better the previous 10 years is not likely to do better the next 10 years. And so what people have said, hey, wait a minute, you mean I can actually be in the upper 10% of probably all investors? And remember earlier I said that the real investors are making less than 10%. And what if because I actually believe I'm going to be in the upper 10%, and I believe that I shouldn't be market timing, that I should stay the course, that means I will stay the course more likely. And that is exactly what we have found. Sure, some people panic in, in, in declining markets, but the, but the index fund, people who own them seem to get it that this is a long-term situation, not what's gonna happen in the next few days. We want lower expenses or no expenses. Some mutual funds now like at Fidelity, they have some zero funds, zero commission to get in, zero management fee to manage. And the interesting thing is, there is still a way for them to make a little money. I mean, that's the, that's the part we have to realize. We went from these expenses that are way up here down to where we would probably say, how can they be making any money if they used to get this and now they get this teeny tiny number? How can they survive? And that is because one, they are very clever, but also they were just making a killing 
and that has been adjusted. Low turnover versus average turnover. If you, if you turn a portfolio over as a manager once a year, it's probably going to cost your investors uh, as much as 1%, according to John Vogel in his studies. So low turnover is a big deal. And of course, with less turnover can come lower taxes. And so what do we get with an index fund? Low expenses, massive diversification, by the way, massive diversification compared to the, to, to, to the actively managed fund. And the academic studies show us that massive diversification actually produces a better rate of return than if a, an advisor or manager has fewer shares. It's counterintuitive. We think because smart people should figure out what the better companies are, that it should be a better rate of return. But that just does not seem to be the case. So index funds have become just uh, by far the, the most invested kind of fund. And what I teach the young people that I'm working with, trying to get them to do the right thing, this one table where it's purely mathematics, it's not about, about anything you're having to pick. It's, uh, it's your, in a sense, you are picking. You're going to pick a return here of 8% as a long-term rate of return. That is a very good long-term rate of return historically. And during the, that's during the accumulation period. And then during the distribution period, 6% and you'd be taken out 4% a year. And then another person is able somehow, maybe because they read we're talking millions that, <laughs> that was mentioned earlier, you got an extra half a percent. Maybe it's lower expenses. Maybe it's more equities. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can get a half extra half a percent. In fact, there's over eight of them in, in, in the book that we offer free to the public and to you, obviously, too. And then you pick up an extra half a percent in, uh, let me go down here and grab my pen so I can actually point at these things. Uh, then you get an extra half a percent during the, the, the distribution stage, and you put in $6,000 a year, and you retire at 65, and you live for 30 years more. By the way, people in college today are likely 50-50 chance that they are going to live to be over 100. I mean, we are talking about much longer average retirements than the people uh, in our meeting today. And that's great, I, I guess, but it means that they better have been a more productive investor and take note of these better rates of return. But look what happens. The total contributions of 240,000 with 8% gives you at, 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 at retirement almost 1.7 million, gives you withdrawals of of 2.6 million, gives you a gift to your children and charities of 2.8 million. And the real return for your lifetime, as far as I'm concerned, because you may be a super saver, but you might not be a great investor. Or you might not be a great saver, but you could be a great investor. There's more than one way to end up with whatever money that you have to distribute and leave to others. But I know this, the combination of what you have at 95 that you leave to others and the 2.6 million in withdrawals, that is what you did with your savings for retirement. That, if you add those two up, is 5.5 million. If we look at those same numbers, making that extra half a percent, it's 6.9, almost 7 million. There's a $1.5 million difference because you found that one half of 1%. That is golden, I think. And my job as an educator is to try to find all of those that I can and to try to find mutual funds and ETFs that are taking the steps to add those additional percentages because that's happening too if you know how they run the inside of, uh, of mutual funds. So what do we know about diversification? I just mentioned that having massive diversification is better than having a little carefully picked companies. So 1960, 
Go back to where I got started in, in the investing process in the 60s. Back then, what they taught me to teach you is you need 10 to 20 stocks, really good companies, companies that you could see continuing to be good for the, for the future. And boy, did we believe in buy and hold. We believe that you should buy those companies. And in those days, you actually got a hard copy of a certificate. And you're supposed to go put that in the lockbox. And then when you're in retirement, only when you're in retirement, you go to the lockbox, you get a certificate, you bring it into the brokerage firm, because this is all we knew. And you say, sell 10 shares, the brokers sell 10 shares, and then they get in a couple of weeks, a replacement less the 10 shares that you're supposed to go back, put back in the lockbox. But what 10 to 20 stocks would you have likely picked in the 60s? The big companies, what were they? Well, General Motors, uh, IBM, General Electric, Sears, Roebuck. You know, what is the what is the outcome of many of these great companies of the 60s that, that we could have put away and just left it there in the lockbox until we needed it for retirement? Well, we know now that that might not end well. In fact, we know now that you would have been better off if you could have, but you couldn't because it wasn't even available if you'd put your money into an S&P 500 index. So by 2000, People believed it's 500 stocks forever. That was the S&P 500. How could somebody believe that the S&P 500 would be the only equity investment that I need? Well, that's because for the previous 25 years, it had compounded at 17.2%. And John Bogle understands how lucky he was to start a mutual fund that tracks the S&P 500 and it tracked, tracked something that made 17% a year and it makes it look like you know what you're doing. But how has it done since 1999? That's the confusing one to people because the compound rate of return has been around between four and four and a half percent when you include the decline that we've been through so far this year. Well, that's not such a great return. I mean, was it a con game that, that John Vogel played on us? No, it's the nature of the business. Asset classes go for long periods of time of amazing returns, and then they don't. And we become most attracted to them at the point that they are doing really well. Like the last five years of 1999, the S&P 500 from 95 to 99 compounded at 28.5%. What did people believe that was going to happen the next decade? They believed it was going to compound at more than 20%. That's because, again, we think linearly. So what have we learned? Well, by, by, by 2010, we learned that instead of having 500 stocks, if we had had 5,000 companies and had some other asset classes, that we would have done just fine. Now, I don't mean we would have gotten rich, but we would not have lost money because from 2000 through 2009, just as it had from 1939, 29 to 38, the S&P 500 lost about 1% a year, and that's before inflation. Back in that earlier period, there was deflation, so you actually came out ahead if you, if, if you took deflation into consideration. That was not true of the 2000 through 2009. It was still hit by inflation, which means 2000 through 2009 was a worse period for the stock market than 1929 through 1938. So by 2020, people like our foundation. And by the way, lots of people were saying, wait a minute, what you need to do, at least looking backwards, is you need to diversify 
beyond one asset class because the S&P 500 is basically a large growth. Now, it's not all growth. It has some value, but the growth component of the S&P 500, because it's what they call a cap-weighted port, uh, index, is driving that portfolio. So what's been doing poorly the first part of the year? Growth which is why the S&P 500 is down more than the value indexes. So what's happened is that lots of people have discovered that a better answer is not 10 to 20 stocks, not 500 stocks in one asset class, but maybe 5,000 stocks in four asset classes or 10 asset classes. And I actually started preaching the 10 asset class strategy in 1995. And that's because I learned it from the academics. And what do we know? Today, there is an article actually written in 2014. You put in, just do a search for 150 portfolios better than yours. And the meaning of that title uh, by Jim Dolly uh, from the White Coat Investor, and you'll see his, his, his URL in a few minutes. Uh, what he was saying was, here are all these people, the Bogleheads, the, uh, the, 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 the experts from all sorts of different areas in our industry, including the, the robo-advisors. What are they advising? And it turns out, that everywhere that you look, that people are getting that, that something that is probably more conservative, really, because it's beyond just having the one asset class, although it will include some small cap value. It will include some small cap blend. I'll show it to you in just a second. What we know is the expectation is all of these 150 portfolios are likely to do better than what most people do on their own. And I will tell you why I absolutely believe that. Target date funds. I'll talk about them in a minute, but target date funds are funds that are run by managers who are managing for certain aged people who are expected to retire later in life, some a long time from now, some a few years from now, but the, the portfolio is balanced for the right amount of equity and the right amount of fixed income. Wharton did a study of these target date funds, 1.2 million investors. And they looked at people in 401k plans that didn't have a target date fund that was just Basically, the target date fund that they were tracking was part S&P 500, actually total market index, which has almost the same return as the S&P 500, U.S. total market international, and different amounts of bonds. But then these other people could pick from a whole laundry list of different kinds of investments. And those people who are doing it themselves, on average, we're, we're set up to make 2.3% a year on average less than the target date fund. Just a simple, in fact, one of those 150 uh, portfolios better than yours. So here's the study that I was showing back in 1995. And the study shows, this was the case I made, let's put all the money in the S&P 500 going back to 1970. And we update this every year. Uh, and then what we do is we see how would it have done over that 52-year period. It would have turned into 23 million. Pretty good. That's an 11% compound rate of return. That, by the way, is the average 40-year return going back to 1928 of the S&P 500. And there it is. Did it again. If you just added 10% in large cap value, just a little bit, it would have raised it by two tenths of 1%. I was talking about a half a percent making a difference. It looks like even two tenths of a percent can make a difference because look at there, it's $25 million instead of 23. And then I add small cap blend and it adds a little. And then I add small cap value and it adds a lot because the small cap value is the gold ring, if you will, of asset classes historically. 
and then you add some REITs, and then you add some international, and then you add some emerging markets. And at the end of the day, you actually have 12 different asset classes. And instead of an 11% compound rated return with 23 million, you end up with $47 million. Now, we always know what we should have done in the past. There is no risk in the past. And anytime somebody shows you a table like this, please remember that. I know what you should have done. That's easy. But did I in any way mislead people by showing this? Well, I'd like to say, no, I didn't because I didn't overweight it to any particular thing. I just said 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 or so of different asset classes. And now this table, and you can look at this later and I, and I hope you will. This table has nine different portfolios, which includes the S&P 500. And you'll notice there's the 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. And then there's a four fund strategy, 25% S&P 500, 25% small cap value, large cap value, small cap blend, just four different asset classes. That's worldwide. Here it is all in the US. Down here, there's a two fund strategy, half in the S&P 500, half in small cap value. And the good news is you can see every the outcome of these strategies. Now, yes, it's looking backwards. Yes, of course, it's hypothetical because in fact, in 1970, you couldn't even invest in the S&P 500. And even if all of these asset classes had real track records, please understand it's still hypothetical because you can't buy the past. Daryl Balls, he is a volunteer for our organization, must put in at least 300 hours a year doing, he, produce, he produces over 160 tables a year plus He's on podcasts with us and does all sorts of things to help us educate. And here's what he shows. For each of these, these different portfolios, what happened to $10,000? How did they do by the decades? That's important. How did they do in the up years? How did they do in the down years? And I'm going to show you something I just think is fascinating. If we look at all 10 years, the S&P 500, lost money since 1970, the average loss was 14.1%. The sum of all of the losing years was 141.1%. And the worst year was a loss of 37. You now know a lot. You could look up here at what they did in the good years too. You would even know more. But if I just, for the sake of it, go over and look at this very simple two-fund portfolio, and I see that it almost had as many winning years. It had one more losing year than the S&P 500. But when you add up all of the losing years, instead of 141, it was 130.1. It was less risky. And its worst year was the same 2008. It was down 36.8%. And then these numbers down here below give you different ways, sharp ratios, Sortino ratios, standard deviation. There are all sorts of ways to manipulate this stuff to figure out what did it feel like? What did it really do for you? How did it do in the good times and the bad times? And then if you really want to learn what it's like to invest in the stock market over the long term and be able to, at every end of every year, see how you did, that's what Daryl did here. Daryl took every year and he looked at four different asset classes, large cap blend, small cap blend, large cap value, small cap value. All these numbers come out of the academic community. And each investment from the S&P 500 
to small cap value had a different color. And there's a fifth one. It's the four fund combo. The average of the four. And I just, I, I would ask you when you have time, look carefully at this table and ask yourself, what is the least volatile of all of these asset classes? If we can count the combination of four as one asset class, look at the one that most of the time is in the middle. Look at the one that is never at the bottom, never at the top, because you can't be at the bottom or the top if you're the average of the four. Which says, if I'm trying to talk to some young person about putting away money for the long term, I'm not sure I'm going to recommend the total market index or the S&P 500. Not when they could, if they could, invest in these four different asset classes. And we'll all be long buried before we ever figure out how they did. And we know that as soon as they have an amount of money that makes it worthwhile for some salesperson to get to them and sell them something that they've got that's better than what they've got, they'll crawl across cross glass to our kids and our grandkids to get to them. And I'm hoping you've shown them this information as to why you might recommend it. And we can look here one year at a time. What do I learn? I learn more about the market by looking at these four years than I ever will the front page of the newspapers. Because I look at the end of the year and I see what happened. I don't care what the news is. We can have a pandemic and have the market go up. So what did it help to know there was a pandemic? What we do find out is when we look at these asset classes one year at a time, we can see, for example, in 1997, a year that small cap value and large cap value did well. Small cap blend and large cap blend didn't do as well. Well, what that tells me is that value was better than growth. Okay? It doesn't look like small was, you know, really better than large. But what about 1998? Something must have happened. I don't know what, but all of a sudden, large is clearly better than small. Small actually lost money, both small cap blend and small cap value. I don't even need to know why. Because if I know why, then probably I'll start thinking, boy, if I can figure that out, I could be a great market timer. No, you can't. There's no evidence you can and there's no way, even if you're lucky, to know whether it was luck or, or, or you really knew something. But the next year, all of a sudden, small cap blend is at the top. And the S&P, which says to me, when I see that, that it looks to me like growth was the best place to be. And doggone it, if it isn't true, because look down here, large cap and small cap value way underproduced large cap blend and small cap blend. And there we go, 2000. Whatever headlines cause value to do better than, than, than growth, it was a big difference. And I'm asking myself, you know, who am I? What is my risk tolerance? Would I rather be something that just kind of stumbles along well, stumbling along to me is particularly interesting if stumbling along makes about 2% more per year than having the S&P 500. No, it doesn't do as well as, as, as the small cap value. I mean, here are the 10-year returns. Small cap value over these decades did well most of the time. S&P 500 did here a couple of decades but I'm really proud of four fun combo. It stayed right in there. It didn't get to be number one, but it was hanging right in there. And yet I see these times. Here's the S&P 500 last. This is, includes T-bills. Here we find S&P 500 underperformed T-bills in the 70 to 79 period. But the four fun combos hanging around up here doesn't mean it's always up there. I mean, here it underperformed the S&P 500. Anyway, you can see where I'm going with this and what I'm trying to get people to think in terms of more than one 
asset class. And there's plenty of combinations to pick from. Predictions for the future. And, and, and they're really how I feel. Boys will be boys. And what I mean by that is I don't care how good I tell people I think the index funds are going to be. Men as a group are attracted to doing things that show that they have the ability to do better than the market. Studies show women make much better long-term investors in terms of trying to beat something. They don't try to beat something. They simply try to find somewhere that feels right and they stay the course. The problem for women as a group, and the reason I wanted to talk to that group of women that said that Lou Mandel knows everything there is to know is because I want them to be more committed to equities over the long term. Their problem is they tend to be really safe oriented. And crooks will, crooks will be crooks. Uh, we'll never get rid of crooks. Many of the companies in the S&P 500 are probably run by crooks. Many politicians are probably crooks. Many doctors are probably crooks. I can't call the people behind cryptocurrency crooks, but a lot of people who are manipulating them and people are, when I call them crooks, I'm saying that I believe that when you are unethical and you know what you're doing, you are hurting somebody, you're taking advantage of somebody. And in my book, they become crooks. They're not legally crooks, but they are crooks because they're taking advantage of people. They're always gonna be there. And so will the academics. And I, I really appreciate the academic community when it comes to this industry. There is no other area that I know that making money is as easy without taking much risk. Remember, in the industry that, that I retired in, we have a, a company that makes good money and doesn't have to own a penny of inventory. The 1.5 billion under management we had when I sold the company in 2012 was your inventory. It wasn't mine. My job was just to manage it. And it be, happens to be an industry that managing other people's money is really really profitable once you get up and you have enough money under management. I mean, think of the people who now have trillions of dollars under management. Think how they're doing. Well, they're not doing as well as they would have in the past because the margins are so thin today. But I believe in the academic community. I believe in peer review. I believe in an honest desire to serve the community they serve, not to unethically tr trick them. I mean, it goes on, I'm sure. And the payoff for education, I just think is huge. I mean, we can find these one halves of 1%, and if we can get people to believe them, I think it'll make a difference. And there's a man, his name is Tim Ranzetta. He is my hero. He runs a company called Next Generation Personal Finance, NGPF.org. They provide free curriculum to middle and high schools for financial, personal finance classes. He is actually hiring lobbyists to go out and to lobby states to convince them to make a semester of personal finance, a requirement. He does not call it a requirement. He thinks in terms of the student, they will have a guarantee to have that. We do not have that here in the state of Washington. We do not have that uh, at, 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 at Bainbridge High School. And I really say, by the way, there are reasons. Of course, there are reasons. I still say, shame on you. Those kids should all, and oh yeah, there are kids who take classes there. And they're probably the people who are the kids of people who talk about these very topics at home. It's the kids that parents aren't talking about these topics that need to be in those classes. And social media 
it's going to cost young people billions. Young people believe that crypto, or they did, they did, that c- cryptocurrency was less risky than the S&P 500. What planet did they come from? Social media. Hourly investment advisors. Um, in a presentation I made during the Financial Literacy Month, I included a, uh, a, a list of uh, fee-only hourly advisors uh, that are in the state of Washington that, that work for very reasonable fees who are supposedly, I've not been the client of all of them, uh, supposedly have, uh, have good track records. Uh, and and uh, so if, if you want to email me, paul at paulmerriman.com, uh, I'll, I'll send you a copy of that, uh, of, of that particular page. But imagine being able to manage a $10 million portfolio for somebody that charges you two or $300 an hour, and it takes two or three hours a year to help you. Think about that versus paying somebody 1%. Target date funds, robo-advised funds, huge, huge. But the target date funds by far the greatest impact. And now almost 50% of all money that's going into 401ks are going into target date funds. It is the equivalent, in my mind, of a pension fund manager who knows that that money that you're putting in there, not the corporation, you're putting in there, maybe there'll be a match, that, that you're going to need that for serious work later in your, in, in your life. And you don't want to waste many years trying to figure out investing when you can put this money into a target date fund where they do it typically more conservative than I want you to be. But if you get that book about we're talking millions, the last half of that book is about target date funds. And I recommend one little step, just add a little bit of small cap value, not much, put 9% into the, uh, uh, the target date fund and 1% of that money into small cap value, it, it could likely add one half of 1% or more to your return. ETFs will continue to become more popular than mutual funds. If you don't know about the advantages of ETFs, uh, one of the websites I just think does a wonderful job, and you'll have a link to it here shortly, is called The Balance. Peer-reviewed articles about subjects people want to know, like like direct indexing. You want to know about direct indexing? You can find out from The Balance, but direct indexing is another up and coming. It it, it is, uh, especially for people who've got a lot of money, but it's going to be available for people who don't have a lot of money. Managing an index fund without carrying any of the burden of other people in that index fund like unrealized capital gains. Right now, most people, the minimum is 100,000. It's going to be down to 5,000, as I understand it, soon. And I'll tell you, I know because I talk to people in mutual funds they are looking for ways to cut the costs even more to investors. These are the truth tellers. I'm a huge fan of the work of John Bogle. He changed my life. He changed the life of everybody and the work that he did in putting pressure on the expense ratios of mutual funds. But these other places, Jim Dolly, The Balance, George Sisti, by the way, George Sisti is a retired United Airlines pilot that lives half the year in the uh, Redmond area and the other half of the year he's down playing golf in Arizona. He has 25, 30 accounts. He loves helping these few people, does not want any more. He's just fine with the few accounts he has. But bless him, he writes a newsletter that is just helps people keep perspective. And Ben Carlson from uh, a, a, a Wealth of Common Sense, I get up every morning, first comes Wordle, then comes Seth Godden, and then comes Ben Carlson. 
If you like numbers and investing and perspective, I don't think there's anybody better than Ben. And then there's Ben Felix. He makes, they're not fancy. It's one of the best presenters on the internet uh, about the way that investing works. And it, he'll get, when he does a, a podcast, I mean, a video, he'll get 100,000 opens. I might get two, three, four, 5,000 opens. He's great. I'll just take a second here. If you want to help a young person, help them with the first five years of their retirement. You can do it by putting a little money away now for later, or you can give them, loan them, I don't care, $6,000 a year. So the first five years, or by the way, motivate them to do this themselves. They could just get them. And I just wrote an article about this. As a matter of fact, rather than spending time talking about that, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you that I hope you will read the article and I do a, a whole podcast and we do a video on this topic. It's up right now on YouTube and it's uh, uh, also available uh, at paulmerriman.com. But I just want you to know with that $30,000 from those first five years, if you follow my advice, I believe that you will over your lifetime have total distributions of over, over 15 million. And I believe you'll leave 22 million to your heirs if you live to be 95. There's the free book, and the, there's a free PDF. I think you can go right here uh, on this site, and you can get you can get it, or you just go to paulmerriman.com backslash uh, sign up. This is our website. I hope you'll visit. Particularly go to Best Advice. That is where all the most important stuff is housed. And we have a calculator financial education, lifetime investment calculator. You can take all of the tables that we've built and put your own numbers in. And here's my friend, John Bogle. The greatest enemies of the equity investor are expenses and emotions. I've been talking about expenses. Emotions are a whole other can of worms. Maybe next time you invite me back, I'll, I'll focus on emotions. And the greatest enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. Stick to the good plan. And let me tell you the difference between John Bogle and Paul Merriman, and it is a major difference. Well, one, I will never have the impact of John Bogle on the masses, but I might have more impact on a few. His whole focus, I sat with him for 90 minutes back in 2017. His focus in life was helping people have enough. He was not trying to, to create more than enough. It was to retire in, what's the word? Uh, I cannot think of, think of the word, but, but to, to be comfortable. And my view is that I'm trying, along with the folks that I'm working with, to have people retire with more than enough. And that is not for purposes of greed. It is because so many of us who had plans, things got in the way. And wanting enough turned out not to be enough. I would rather hope for the best, but prepare for the worst, which means I need to try to have more than enough. And hopefully, Bainbridge Community Foundation will benefit. Hopefully, uh, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Arts will benefit. Uh, uh, Bainbridge Performing Arts, uh, who knows, Frank's uh, astronomy program. I mean, th there is an advantage of having more. And it gets to be an even, as you all know, a bigger advantage as we get older because it's, it's fun. Here are the places on my website. The tables are there. You can go there if you just want to go look at the tables. And on each of these pages will be a podcast, will be tables, and an article to talk about these different uh, aspects of what we do. And again, my email address is there for you and where you can sign up for the newsletter and get the We're Talking Millions. There are over 700 articles and podcasts and videos on our site. 
and I really appreciate having the chance to uh, to talk with you. And I'm going to escape, not from the room, but from this, and answer questions if we have time. Yeah, Paul, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, and thanks for the shout out for Battle Point Astronomical Association. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a question in the chat from Steve Johnson. Um, can you see that or you want me to read it? Oh, why don't you read it, please? Okay, Steve wants to know, Paul, can you uh, tell us what percent of Americans are in general, uh, in general terms, not investors? How, and how can we move to help that group participate in the American dream like us oatmealers and other members of the investor class? Well, yeah, let's remember uh, about this group. Uh, when we were young, uh, uh, there, I think about 50% of us would have had a pension. Today, it's less than 5%. So that's a change. Uh, so we weren't even expected to put money in in the beginning. We may have later in life, but other people were putting it away for us. So that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle is they're, they're getting out of college with a bunch of debt. And they are told by a lot of people that they need to pay that debt off first. One of the reasons I'm not a fan of Dave Ramsey is he's, he's, he, he's huge, he has a huge following. I'd love to have his follow. But he, he gives people advice that I think uh, allows people not to take the responsibility of investing early. I even recommend that, that young people, if, if, if they really want to take care of themselves financially, if they have to take a second job in those early years, get money socked away, balance paying off your debt, particularly if you have low cost debt, but balance paying off your debt, certainly with the money that your company is going to match for you in your 401k, because that's what's going to get you where you're going. And, and, and I think if we can afford it, and here's the problem. To answer the question, half of the people in the country are investing in the stock market. And half of those are not doing a very good job, maybe even more than half, from what we know from the studies. So I would like to think that the one thing that's going to make a huge difference is Tim Branzetta. His goal is to have every high school in America have a six-month required, guaranteed personal finance course. And if he does that, and Lou, my old friend Lou, he didn't have a great belief that the future would, would, would hold, that these kids would, in fact, remember what they learned. But Tim Ranzetta is taking it to way beyond what Lou ever thought about doing. He has games. He's teaching the teachers how to teach. He's inspiring the teachers. He has, a, he has a budget of 5 to $6 million a year that he pays for out of his own pocket and does not take a penny from his organization. He has a passion unlike anybody I know to help this country. So it takes people like Tim and people like you to find a way to get to the folks in your family. What I did with my kids they all got my help to do their early IRAs. And I still got two kids, 126, 130, that uh, you know, I still got a little work in, in helping them. I put the money in with the agreement. If, uh, and, 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 and I know, because I can see what they've done. If they liquidate any of that IRA before they're either 60 years old or before I'm dead, it's the last money. I will immediately redo my will. So they know how serious I am about this money being there for the long term. And yes, I do believe in ruling from and, and controlling from the grave. <laughs> uh, some people are good at that. Others are not. But the, but the bottom line is we need to educate people and the people who most need the education are not getting it at the dinner table because their parents, as one of the reasons I love supporting the class at Western, about 44% of the students there are first generation college students. And I beg them to take my book home to their parents. Any other questions? 
Yeah, so gentlemen, you know the drill, raise your hands. Uh, and uh, 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 Terry has joined us. Uh, Terry, glad to see, we're so happy to see you again. Uh, Terry's got his hand up and he has a question. Go ahead, Terry. Well, I'm happy to see me back too. <laughs> but uh, uh, the question I have is that uh, you've said a lot about finances and you said something about uh, college and and uh, and that and you know in in a lot of nation the nations in Europe the, they don't pay for college the the college is paid for and that means that rich kids and poor kids go there based on un they go they go there based on their IQ how do we get that going in this country if they're gonna you know, just talk about the rich people being able to go to our universities. Our tuition at my university is like, I think it's $7,000 a quarter now. It was $52 when I went in 1952. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I'll respond. Uh, and that is... Uh, we, we, we all have to, 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 to vote for that. And the reality is it doesn't look very likely that that kind of vote is going to be taken unless there are some, some massive changes. And, uh, and so I'm trying to figure out how to reach people uh, without them being able to get that education. And that means that I need to figure out ways to reach kids that are coming out of high school and going to work. Because it isn't just about coming out of college. Kids that get out of college would like to think they know how to solve problems. Uh, although the reality is this is a problem that most of them aren't able to solve until later in life when they've had a chance to lose money or to miss opportunities. Wow. And Warren Buffett said, you know, you can learn the hard way, but it's much better to learn from other people's mistakes. And, 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 and that's what my work is about. It's not just about the right things to do, but let me tell you about the mistakes that people make because they want you to make them. It's not like, like they, they don't care about you. They care about them. And what is in your best interest is not in their best interest. And, and, and that's the battle. And so I get to have them or you get to have them a little tiny bit. I'll go into a class and preach for an hour and a half. And, uh, and then I leave. Uh, and I might as well, in a sense, unless they go to my website, be dead. And then the other people get a shot at. It. And we all know the last person to make us the last person to get a chance to make a pitch is very often the person who makes the sale. Yeah. So how do we scare the heck out of them and believe that the world is is partly evil? Uh, and believe that all salespeople in my book, Get Smarter, Get Screwed, that's free on my site as well. And it's, it's how to select the best and get the most out of your investment advisor. I'd, I really am not count, kind to stockbrokers. And I have lots of brokers that are friends of mine, but I'm not kind about it. I list 80 different reasons I don't want you to deal with a commission-based uh, advisor. But they all belong to your church, or they all belong, they're all nice, they know how to treat people like friends, and they win because they're the last person to make the sale unless somebody like you comes into their life and says, I, I really care. In fact, in the past, I recommended that we, that we leave some money somehow to these people and that in leaving it, we also leave them a letter that tells them why this money is there and tells them what we want to do with this letter. And, and, and we even left you a picture that we know you've noted how much you like that picture on our, on our bookcase there. We left that picture to you. And the reason we left that picture to you is because we want you to remember what our dream was for you with that little pile of money we left for you because people are gonna want that pile of money for other things. I mean, we gotta figure out how do we do the same kind of manipulative things that these other people, we gotta fight manipulation with manipulation. 
but we're going to be gone. So we have to do something while we are alive to get them committed to the right thing for when we're gone. Mm -hmm. And that's what all parents want, but we don't have any idea how to do it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> what do you got for me? Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Uh, guys, I know you got questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm looking at the screen. Jim, you've got your hand up. You're waving your hand. Uh, go ahead, Jim. Unmute yourself. There he goes. Uh, we... Um... We're pretty ignorant of, as far as investing goes, and uh, uh, advice of my brother-in-law, um, we put our funds in Vanguard because they have a commission rate. Uh, it's great for a, an advisor at 0.03 percent. Uh, we also set up a 529 plan for our grandchildren to Great. guarantee they have some yep. funds for education. But uh, I think her talk is fascinating, but uh, my knowledge is pretty limited. You, you know, uh, I understand. Um, by the way, for people who are... Uh, um, interested in, in Vanguard's offerings. I have a, a, a video. It's the most popular video I've ever done. I did it for the senior center on Bainbridge. And, um, and we had 12 people who watched it live. And we've had 115,000 people open it and look at it. It's entitled My Favorite 12 Vanguard Funds for Retirees. I think Vanguard while their service level has has suffered, uh, they got a lot of problems in terms of service. Uh, their money management is, is, isn't suffering. And uh, but I hope that if you have an interest in Vanguard, now uh, I know what they typically do with that, where they pay, where you pay them thirty basis points, and I and I I know how their advisory service works and I, and I think they do a really good job. They are very, very conservative. And when you have more than enough, uh, you can afford to be conservative and probably should be conservative. But I'm happy that you're at Vanguard. He gave you really good advice. I can take one more if I might, Frank. Okay, we've got, well, yeah. How many more you got? I got two hands raised. Uh, Chuck right, has a question go. and then Proctor. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, yes, talking about uh, college and the enormous uh, you know, debt overhang that people can have, uh, one uh, route is to have the kid go to a, a community college for two years and then transfer to a four-year college after that. Uh, that can make a, a big difference financially. But I guess the concern is, the statistics aren't good for people going to community, co community college, ending up with a bachelor's within six years, quote unquote. So do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, you're, you're running a risk when you and send the kids to community college that uh, they'll just sort of flame out. I do not. I do not. I have a, a, a nephew. I helped his brother get through the University of Washington financially. Uh, and gave him 3000 bucks a year. What I'm doing for the kid who's going to community college and working part-time and living at home, I'm helping him fund a Roth IRA instead. And he's going to get 12,000 bucks into a Roth IRA instead of into an education, because I think that's more likely uh, what his future is going to be. And that's great. I mean, he's, it, it'll be a home run for him, I think. Yeah. I get just just a concern. Will the kid get distracted and end up in a, a low wage job forever? Well, uh, you know something. I think uh, I've never been anything but a reasonably intelligent salesperson all my life. That's what I've been, and I chose to be a teacher in the financial industry. But I would have been happy being a teacher in public schools. 
Yeah. And uh, I was not destined for anything great. I just did things I loved. I think that 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 this nephew of mine is going to make a really fine salesperson. And <laughs> I'm going to do all I can to motivate him in that direction because he's an honest, smart kid. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I think he'll still graduate. I, I'm, I'm not saying he's not going to go on. Yeah. He's, but he's going to do it on his own. He doesn't need any help. I'm just worried about kids who get a part-time job that has good tips. And they say, well, why do I need to go to college? I can keep getting $100 a shift in tips. And that's about it. Well, remember, I think the average number of jobs that a, that, that a person has by the time they're 30 in this society is seven. Yeah, yeah. I just can't believe it. Let's Proctor. let Proctor get his question in here, because I know, Paul, you got to go. Let's go ahead, Proctor. Thank you, Paul. I wondered whether you've noticed a significant difference in the questions you receive or the um, traffic on your website over the last four months. Um, compared to when the market was booming? Uh, boy, that's a great question. Um, I, no, I think that I have been appealing because my, my work is so driven by so much math and, and numbers that uh, I continue to get that kind of traffic. Um, I'm getting more... It's hard for me to know because I, for example, I just wrote this article about how to help your kid. And I've gotten a whole bunch of responses from parents who want more details about this. They want to know how, when they can start paying their child as a seven-year-old. And so is it the article that caused all this or are people really, because it's a radical difference. Are they really trying to figure out how to help their kids when, when the kids are younger based on, by the way, the kid doing something to get it, which is pretty cool. If they can learn that you, that by the way, you cannot do a Roth IRA uh, based on an allowance. You could give a kid an allowance and, and tell him, well, you expect them to do a lot of things. That is not permittable. What you can do is say, I'll give you X to mow the lawn. I'll give you X to do, to, the, to do the dusting, whatever it is. That is, according to the accountant, CPAs, allowable, but not an allowance as income that you could match. Whether the kid puts the money away or not, you can get it in there. You can do a custodial uh, Roth IRA at, uh, at Schwab and put it in small cap value, what I thought that would be. Thank you, Paul, as always. Doctor, thank pleasure. You. Nice to see your face, your smiling face. The gentlemen, thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, what you guys do. I talk to people all over the country, and I have not run across a place I can go move and find an oatmeal club. So i got to stay here. <laughs> We're happy to have you here. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Paul. And I'll give it back to Jim for some final words. Go ahead, Jim. Well, the final word is don't move, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, a deal. <laughs> you know, on behalf of all of us, uh, we want to tell you, it is so intriguing to find somebody with the zeal and character you do and and to be one of our members, you know, and this is family. Yeah, so thank you so much. I'm the lucky one. Thank you. Yeah, we are all lucky. All right. mm -hmm. God bless you all. All right. Terry, your smiling face. Uh, you feel good enough to do 